Um, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, we are starting our uh, today's uh, lecture by James Bridal. I'm very excited to see uh, our guest today here with us. Uh, I'm also excited uh, about all our uh, online viewers, which are hopefully watching our um, stream online on YouTube or contact platforms. So um, let me um, begin. So uh, today's talk is a part of the pu public program of the exhibition Hydra, New Media Art and Context of Eka Anxiety, which is on the view in Sivka Port in St. Pittsburgh. Uh, you can visit this exhibition if you still didn't uh, till January 31. The exhibition and public program are created by Olga Vat and Lydia Guminyuk from another curatorial agency. The event is held as a part of the UK-Russia Creative Bridge 2021-2022 uh, program with the support of the Culture and Education Department of the British Embassy in Moscow. Our today's guest is uh, James Bridal. I'm really a big fan of him. Uh, is a writer and an artist working uh, across technologies and disciplines. The artwork have been commissioned by galleries and institutions and exhibited worldwide and on the internet. The writing on literature, culture, and networks has appeared in magazines and newspapers, including Wired, The Atlantic, The New Statesman, The Guardian, and The Observer. The author of The New Dark Age, uh, which was published in 2018, and uh, Ways of Being, which will be published in 2022. And they wrote and presented new ways of seeing for BBC Radio 4 in 2019, which uh, I also really like, uh, especially the last episode about um, like a new type of ecologies. So um, for today's event, uh, it is planned that we are starting from a, a James lecture. And then um, there will be a question and answer uh, session. Um, which you can also uh, like a take a part in. So you can ask your questions uh, in the chats um, on YouTube or contact it, and we'll forward your questions uh, to our speaker. So James, uh, you're really welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, thanks to the audience for being here. Um, and yeah, uh, happy to, uh, to talk about these things. So let's get my slides up if that's possible. There we go. Um, yeah, I didn't know what stupid title to give this talk. Uh, I immediately thought of Fela Kuti uh, and his amazing song, World to No Get Enemy, um, uh, which points obviously to the uh, ecological importance of waters, as well as being an incredibly good song, um, the importance of which may become clear during this lecture. Uh, but then I also uh, thought a lot about Bruce Lee's uh, imperative to be water, my friend, uh, and the fact that two of these uh, uh, philosophical geniuses have both come to uh, water as being uh, an essential component of our thinking, uh, which is what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, I'm going to frame this first of all, like why I'm trying to ask and maybe answer some of the questions that will come up during this talk. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think maybe art should be doing right now, a very little bit about that. Uh, and then going to talk about various bits of research and history that I've been looking into, uh, particularly with regard to uh, my new book, which is really about how to bring technology, ecology, and our lives and the lives of everything else on this planet into slightly better balance. Uh, and at the end, I'll share a little bit about some new work that's just starting that is also another kind of answer to these questions, possibly. Um, my work has been largely, for the last decade or so, about the social and political implications of technology. Uh, by which I mean I'm really interested in the internet as one of the kind of grandest uh, inventions and also social experiments in human history. 
the way that we've constructed a kind of global um, communications network that is also a kind of global sensorium, like a global way of seeing and thinking the world. Um, and yet we seem to have very little idea what it is. Uh, the image of the cloud that we return to all the time, I think is a fascinating one. Um, you know, we call this agglomeration, accumulation of computers, the cloud, uh, historically because it was something we didn't have to think about because it was something that happened over there that we shouldn't worry about. Uh, and of course we should worry about it. We should think about it very carefully um, because, uh, because it affects our lives all the time and we should think about that. Um, but also the ways in which the cloud is both a, a terrible and a quite interestingly good metaphor. It's, it's bad in that it hides what it does. Um, it makes it seem like it's ethereal and numinous, like a cloud, when actually it's very concrete and real with very serious environmental effects. I'll go into a bit detail in a second. Um, but also, I, I like the fact that it's sort of watery and distant and strange and unpredictable. Um, because actually technology is often like those things as well in ways that I'll explain. But this is the, the way I want to frame this talk, which is that we have constructed this extraordinary global technological communications network that envelops the whole globe and that we live inside. And yet we've done it with very little thought indeed for the earth itself. Um, these two graphs here both go in the same direction. Um, the one on the left is the graph of Moore's law, which is the rule of thumb, which says that computing power doubles every two years. Um, that's held true since the 1960s. We have ever more powerful and efficient computers um, that supposedly allow us to think and compute ever more efficiently. Uh, about ever more things with ever more information. And on the right, we have the Keeling curve, the levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide measured at Mauna Loa in Hawaii, uh, also in this case since the 1960s. Two upward curves uh, with perhaps different or perhaps the same impact on our lives. Um, uh, one is making the world increasingly uninhabitable. And I'll leave you to think um, about which one of it I mean. Um, but that they have a relationship is undeniable. Uh, the internet has a, a carbon footprint uh, as big as and, and growing ever bigger than the entire aviation industry. Uh, computers are major uh, producers of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Um, we haven't yet figured out how to address that effectively. Um, but for me, there is also a kind of cognitive relationship between these two graphs. Uh, ever increasing computing power is also apparently leading to ever greater confusion and uncertainty in the world. Um, the overwhelming amounts of information causing distrust, uncertainty, fear, and anger. And not just because there's so much information, but because that information doesn't seem to match up with the world, it seems to have no connection to it. And so we find ourselves on a planet that's growing hotter and hotter and more and more angry, even as we produce more of these technologies that are um, supposed to improve uh, our lives and, and, the, and the, the condition of the world. Um, that other graph that just popped up there, actually, I wanted to share as well, because it's particularly striking to me. This is the um, talking, this graph is referring to the carbon dioxide emittances specifically of artificial intelligence as one kind of computation. Uh, but particularly as the kind of computation that we seem to hold up as being the most exciting and most interesting and most vital at the present, uh, the one that generates all the hype and is supposed to solve all the problems of the future is also one of the most energy intensive uses of computers we could possibly imagine. Training AI models requires huge, huge amounts of data and information and also huge, huge amounts of energy. Um, so this, this thing, that's supposed to be intelligent is also obviously incredibly stupid in the sense that it is directly contributing to the warming of the planet and then the extinction of millions and billions of individuals, including members of our own species. 
what the hell is, <laughs> is that intelligence really supposed to be about? And I mentioned it in particular because I wanted to contrast two kinds of making digital work in response to the environment and to ecology. Uh, this is a screenshot of a, a work you can find online of mine called Cloud Index that I made a few years ago. Cloud Index used neural networks, used artificial intelligence, machine learning, whatever you want to call it, um, to compare and contrast uh, weather patterns in the UK uh, with voting intentions in the Brexit referendum. Uh, it sought to establish and computationally did establish, seemed to prove that the um, um, there was a connection between uh, Brexit voting patterns and the weather. Uh, and my contention being then, uh, you could start to engineer the weather as governments around the world already do to produce different voting patterns. It was sort of a joke, sort of serious. Uh, it was mostly intended as a way for me to really try and play with these kind of technologies and understand them, which is what I tend to do in my work. I find new technologies that interest me and I poke at them and I pull at them so that I can understand them well enough to tell different stories with them. Because it tends to be the only people who tell stories with technologies are people who make them for large corporations. And they only have one story to tell, uh, which is capitalism and how to make money out of them and how to make money out of us. And I think these technologies have the potential to tell different types of stories, possibly counter narratives or entirely different stories altogether. And so this is what I do. I, I play with these technologies. But I am also increasingly unsatisfied with this way of making work, particularly if what I or we want to make work about is about the environment, about ecology. I think the time is over when we can make work that's representational, that just tells stories about things. I'm interested in work that does work. Uh, I'm interested in work that actually participates in acts of regeneration and remediation, work that works to repair the climate, to mitigate the worst excesses of climate change, uh, and to try and make a better world. Um, for, as an example of the kind of work I'm talking about, um, this is possibly my favorite. Uh, this is um, uh, Hans Hacker's 1972 work, Rhinewater Purification Plant, which is a tank and filtration system installed in a gallery next to the River Rhine that drew water out of the highly polluted river um, and, and cleaned it uh, and, and made it um, uh, uh, purer, better, and then returned it to the river again. So this is an artwork that does the work, that is a work about ecology, but is doing ecological work as it does it. And for me, that's kind of what I'm most interested in at the moment. How can we do work? How can we make work that does the work, that actually participates in the, uh, in the systems that we're talking about uh, and that tries to come up with actual working answers to those systems rather than merely illustrating them or commenting on them? Um, so now I'm going to talk about the kind of main body of my research most recently that I think will relate, you'll see in certain ways, to the, uh, to the nature of the exhibition we're discussing, because uh, it all comes back to water in the end, or at least it comes back to the earth, to the world. As I've said, one of the problems I think is that uh, the way in which we think about and make technology at the present has kind of become separated from the earth, from the world, from the things around us, uh, have become abstracted to the point that it's actively dangerous and damaging the planet and our own ways of thinking about it. And one of the places that starts is here. Uh, this is a diagram representing Alan Turing's automatic machine, which he first described in 1936, the, the original computer, um, the computer that started it all, but also the computer that I'm talking to you through now and the computer that you're using, um, because this is also known as the universal Turing machine. It's the basis for almost all, 99.99999% of all modern computers. Um, it, it's, it's an incredibly simple schema for writing ones and zeros or other symbols to a piece of tape, uh, reading them back off again, processing them, writing them again. That's all it does, but that's all your computer does as well. 
This is all computers and it can do all the computing that we do today. Um, it's the same thing that Turing wrote about in 1936. But it is also, crucially, only one kind of computer. Uh, from the very beginning, Turing opened a door that everyone ignored to other kinds of thinking about computers. In particular, in a paper in 1950, he contrasted the, uh, that machine, the automatic machine, the universal machine, the machine we all use today, with another kind of machine that he called the Oracle machine. And he doesn't say very much about the Oracle machine. Um, he subtly hints that it wouldn't be automatic in the sense that it wouldn't just do whatever it was told. In fact, uh, at certain points, uh, it would look outside itself for answers or hints to the problems that it was working on. It would not be entirely self-contained. Therefore, it wouldn't be completely abstracted. It would be perhaps part of the world. But all he really said about it in a tiny foot, foot, footnote was whatever it is, it cannot be a machine. And trying to think about what he meant by that um, has taken me down some very interesting and weird routes. And I'm gonna share with you some things that are not really machines, that are other forms of computers, or at least other ways of thinking about computers and technology that might be a guide to thinking ourselves out of the way we've been thinking for some time now. An interesting place to start is with uh, the tortoises of Grey Walter. Grey Walter was a, a, a neurologist, neuro, neurophysicist, um, who in the 1940s uh, built these tiny robots, uh, which he called tortoises, because they were kind of little shells with wheels. They had a little light on top. And they'd, they had a little light sensor, and they'd move towards the nearest light and, um, and follow it. Uh, and if they got too close, they'd sort of back away and try and get around it. And if they bumped into things, they'd move around it. And the tortoise is kind of the first self-aware, possibly even intelligent automaton. It's a, it's a form of artificial life that doesn't look anything like the kind of artificial intelligence as we talk about today, because it lived in the world. Rather than being inside a computer and being fed data, it kind of goes out exploring into the world. And, and the reason this is interesting is because it, it underlies what's different about the kind of thinking about machines and intelligence that happened in the 1940s and 1950s and 1960s under the name of cybernetics. Cybernetics was concerned less with intelligence as we think of it now, as something that exists inside the head or inside the machine, but intelligence is something that existed out in the world in relationship with the world as something that was embodied, but also interpersonal, that existed as a kind of relationship with other things. The tortoises were inspired by a, another artifact of 1940s cybernetics called the homeostat by William Ross Ashby. This is a very strange machine. These four boxes here were actually bomb sites in the Second World War. They're machines for aiming bombs. But Ashby, another neuropsychologist, discovered that if he wired them together, they exhibited brain-like behavior. You could change the settings on one, and the other ones would react, and they'd learn about those settings. This wasn't an automatic machine like Turing's step-by-step -step algorithm machine. This was a machine that was capable of learning. It was kind of brain. Again, this sets the... the the scene for cybernetic thinking in the 1960s and 70s are things that react to the world around them rather than being wholly internalized, wholly um, disconnected from the world around them. One of the places that some of the other cyberneticians went at this time starts to become increasingly crazy. Um, there was a guy called Stafford Beer, an English cybernetician in the 50s, who, who'd seen the tortoise and who'd seen the homeostat and thought they were kind of interesting. He didn't think they went nearly far enough. He'd been asked by his bosses at uh, US Steel, one of the largest corporations in the, t in the world at the time, to automate its factories, to bring in computer systems to make those factories more efficient. But Beer didn't think it was enough just to automate things. He thought they needed to be, in some way, intelligent. They needed to um, be able to react again to the world around them. 
And so he built up these kind of extraordinary schemas of, of inputs and outputs and data that we fed into this thing in order to make it be able to react to the situation around it, to the prices of goods or the conditions of the stock market. He felt that a factory needed to be less like a computer and more like an organism. And so at the heart of it, in the middle of those little kind of uh, circular arrows at the bottom of the diagram, he imagined there would be a kind of brain. But he had no idea what kind of brain this would be. He said famously, you can't just go ahead and design the thing because then you'll get what you expect. And that's exactly what we're trying not to do. Uh, just as Turing had said, whatever it is, it can't be a machine. Because when we design something like a machine, it just does whatever we say it, we, it should do, which is exactly what we're trying not to do. So where do you find a brain to go inside something like this? Well, one of the places that uh, uh, Beer started looking uh, was in ponds. And in fact, at some point in the 1960s, he set up a large tank of water in his basement uh, that he filled with various uh, kinds of literally pond life small microorganisms he gathered in buckets from the woods near his house. These included things like Daphnia, Hydra, leeches, cyclops, tiny kind of microscopic organisms. And, and he tried to make them behave, not exactly like a computer, but as something responsive to inputs and outputs. So for example, with the Hydra, which um, respond to light uh, in much the same way as the tortoises did, he would hang small lights over the tank uh, and then turn them off and on according to different bits of data, and then sense the way in which the organisms moved in order to try and understand what they were thinking and feed that back into his uh, cybernetic factory. Or with the Daphnia, he fed these tiny little critters iron filings so they became magnetic, and then passed electromagnetic waves through the water in order to try and establish some kind of cybernetic relationship with these tiny organisms. His experiments didn't seem to go anywhere, but actually it turns out that they were incredibly prescient because we're starting to discover now that microorganisms not too unlike this are actually very good at computation indeed. The one that everyone's getting excited about at the moment, oh, excuse me. Uh, the one that everyone's getting excited about at the moment that you might have heard about is a thing called slime molds. Slime molds are very weird little creatures. Um, they, uh, they don't, no one's quite sure what they are, for starters. They're not really fungi, they're not algae, they exist somewhere like those things, but different. They also don't really appear to be what we consider to be individuals. It's quite hard to figure out what one slime mold is and what is a group, because at times they kind of glom together into big jelly-filled sacks of nuclei, and then sometimes they kind of go off and do their own thing. But one thing they do, is grow like you see this one doing towards sources of food and they spread out and explore the world around them in super interesting ways. And we've discovered that they can do some certain interesting tricks uh, like this. Researchers discovered uh, that uh, in, given the right conditions and the right basic uh, inputs, uh, within 24 hours, a slime mold was able to uh, recreate incredibly accurately the entire layout of the uh, Tokyo Metro rail and transit network. So what's happening here is that on a piece of slide, a little bit of glass, the researchers have placed the slime mold, the yellow blob, and they've placed little bits of food representing major population areas. And what you don't see so clearly in this as well is there's also light and dark areas, because slime molds don't like bright light. And so by shining lights in particular areas, you can simulate natural obstacles like mountains or railways that you want your transit network to avoid. And so the slime mold spreads out and very quickly, it starts to make these interconnections between particular places in the most efficient manner possible. And that's what's key here. It took, it took incredibly brilliant Japanese uh, rail engineers decades to figure out kind of optimum routing for certain tracks, and the slime mold did this in, in 24 hours, which is a, a neat trick. Uh, it's not as neat as this one, though, which is kind of more impressive. There's a thing in computer science and in mathematics called the traveling salesman problem. The traveling salesman problem says, if you have to visit six cities, say, 
what's the shortest route that visits each one once and only once? It's a relatively simple problem that's very hard to figure out, or at least it takes a while to do it mathematically. And more to the point, as soon as you add one more city, it becomes much harder because to do six cities, there's one times two times three times four times six times five times six possible routes. Uh, you add another city and it's one times two times three times four times five times six times seven routes. It's what called an exponential problem. The graph of how difficult it is goes like this, straight up into the air. That means computers are really, really bad at it. Uh, it's an incredibly hard problem that people throw billions and billions of dollars at. Uh, and we haven't really got anywhere better at it since the 17th century. The slime mold, on the other hand, thinks this isn't that hard. Slime molds can solve the troubling salesman problem in linear time. I, the graph of their time to solve it is a straight line. You add more cities, it doesn't get any harder for them. They're better at our best supercomputers at this incredibly difficult um, uh, computational problem. We still don't really understand how, um, and they probably don't understand why. What I quite like about this is the huge mismatch in what we're interested in and what we can presume the slime mold is interested in. Nevertheless, here is an ability exhibited by a biological organism that completely outpaces the very best of human technology. And I, for one, find that to be incredibly interesting. So we have weird ways, we have weird ideas about what intelligence is, right? Coming from the cybernetician. That, that um, perhaps what matters for intelligence and thinking isn't being a really powerful machine inside a box, but is a box that is in some way open to the rest of the world and therefore can learn from the things around it. And from the things like the slime molds, we We have the realization that different ways that our machines and our brains are simply not capable of solving. That there are many, there are many ways of thinking as there are minds and that they have many different capabilities. And the, the other thought that goes along with the, those ones is really that there's many, many ways to build computers themselves. You don't just have to build a computer out of uh, you know, plastic and metal, and you don't just have to build it out of ones and zeros either. Uh, you can build a computer out of anything, like billiard balls, for example. This is a schema for building a computer out of billiard balls, snooker balls. I don't know which is more popular in Russian. Cool. Um, sorry. Um, uh, here are two logic gates. Logic gates are the basis of every computing device. They're simply little uh, devices that say where the ones and zeros come out when ones and zeros go in. Um, if you have an AND gate, uh, one comes out when two ones go in, for example. Out of these gates, you can build any type of computer. Now imagine a billiard table with two shoots going down into it and one pocket at the end. If you drop a ball into one shoot, it rolls into the pocket at the other end. If you drop a ball into the other shoot, it rolls into the pocket at the other end. But if you drop balls down both shoots, they bounce off each other and neither goes into the shoot. That's called an OR gate, uh, which is the one that's illustrated on the left, I think. Uh, so you can build a kind of physical implementation of a computer with if you have enough billiard tables. But here's the thing, you don't need to use billiard balls either. You can use almost any kind of things. For example, crabs. These are um, Japanese soldier crabs, uh, blue soldier crabs, I believe. These things live in incredibly huge numbers in shallow lagoons off the Japanese coast. And they're very well known because they tend to form at mating season, huge swarms, um, thousands strong that kind of roll across the seabed. Uh, and even though there's thousands of them, they actually behave in very predictable ways. Uh, the ones at the front kind of move forward, ones at the sides roll around and join the back, and they have this very strong kind of directional impulse. And so researchers at the University of Tokyo built logic gates, like the ones I've just been describing from billiard balls, out of crabs, which is just as scary as you can imagine. They, ima they took swarms of these crabs uh, and ran them through physical installations of logic gates. Uh, it's a crab computer. 
a computer built out of crap. You can build computers out of literally anything you want to do. You can even make it out of a bucket of water. This is from a, a really amazing paper called Pattern Recognition in a Bucket. Um, these researchers took a bucket of water, they placed it on, a, on an overhead projector. So one of those um, big lamp light sources that cast the shadow onto the wall. And they fed speech, human speech through speakers, through this water so that it formed ripples. And then they had another camera looking at that, which analyzed those patterns of, um, in order to try and, try and understand human speech. And they discovered that by putting the speech through a bucket of water before feeding it into a um, speech recognition system, they massively improved the performance of the speech recognition system. Uh, by, by, by including the bucket of water, this physical transition, into a computational system, they were capable of improving its performance. Something here about, um, uh, about the different ways in which beings, including machines, understand, visualize, consider, or think about information. There's a kind of physical transformation here, uh, a connection to the world and specifically to water that enabled a translation between the human and the machine that I think is significant and fascinating. This isn't the only time water has cropped up in computational history, in fact, far from it. Um, I should probably speed up a bit, but I enjoy talking about these things too much. So I've got another 10 minutes or so, I think. Uh, this is one of Vladimir Lukyanov's hydrological computers from the 1936, uh, 1930, I um, Lukyanov was a Soviet engineer who was tasked with building a series of railways in Siberia. Uh, and one problem they had was that the concrete kept freezing and then thawing and cracking and so on and so forth. Very difficult, as you're probably more aware than I am, given your climate, of building things in super cold weather. And what he needed to do was figure out the thermal properties of concrete um, under different temperatures, which is really complicated differential equations. And there were no calculators available for doing this. So he built one, but he didn't build a binary computer. He built a computer full of water. Uh, this, this computer was made of thousands of little pipes filled with water. That meant when you filled up, as you added water at a certain place, water went through different pipes elsewhere uh, out, from which you could read the results of your, of your calculation. Um, this is entirely different to doing calculation of ones and zeros with binary. It's, it's continuous and it's also very good at things like differential equations. Uh, and very quickly it was realized that this kind of computer was actually useful for many more things than building railways. Um, and hundreds of these were built in the Soviet Union and were in use uh, in Soviet institutions up until the 1980s, I've been told. Um, because they're very good at certain types of calculations, even if they are quite difficult to maintain. Um, in the US, um, there's a, another type of, of hydrological computer, which I'm very fond of. There was a, a kind of fad, I guess, in the US in the second half of the 20th century for building um, uh, river, bay, basin, hydrological models. So this, is, this photograph shows only a very small part of the Mississippi River Basin model, which was first constructed in the 1940s. The Mississippi, drains something like half of the continental US. It's a huge river system. Um, and it's obvious, and it's one that's alive and that is moving all the time. And a large part of the history of the United States, in particular of its agriculture, is this kind of battle with the Mississippi. Um, this attempt to kind of constrain it, to keep it in place, to stop it moving around. Uh, and once it's been stopped, to then stop it flooding from where it's, you know, into where it wants to go. As part of this battle to control the river, um, the US Corps of Engineers constructed a, a model that's hundreds and hundreds of meters across, a complete scale model of the river uh, into which they could pour thousands of gallons of water to test what it would happen if you put a bridge here or a dam here or there. Uh, they could also predict where flooding would occur. Um, so by adding water according to certain storms and modeling where the flood defenses were, they could warn people in advance uh, where, where there was likely to be danger 
which they did many times over many decades. So this isn't just a simulator or a predictor, it's also a computer. Uh, it figures out answers. And what I think is interesting about it is that it does it in the medium it's concerned with, right? It's, it's trying to calculate water, and so it does the calculations with water. But also, more than that, it, it, it does them in the world. Its calculations are, are connected to the world itself in crucial ways that, that computers alone are not capable of. And also, as a side benefit, it's legible to humans, right? You can look at this thing, and as someone who doesn't understand complex simulations, you can understand how this model functions, which I think is really important. As I said, they built a bunch of these, and I'll go through them quickly. This is the Chesapeake Bay model, Chesapeake Bay model. This is the area around Washington, DC. I just show this mostly because I love this picture so much of this bearded guy operating the model, because uh, it looks so much like the work of, of Super Studio, the futurist Italian collective from the 1970s, where I think we're predicting this in some way, but I'll move on because I've got time. Um, if you're ever lucky enough to be in San Francisco, uh, make yourself even more lucky by visiting the San Francisco Bay model which is the only one of these still operating. You can still go and see it, it's still working. Um, and it's a thing of wonder. Um, my final example of, of a hydrological computer at this point where liquids, waters meet computational thinking is a computer called the Monia, which I first saw in the Science Museum in uh, London when I was a child. Uh, this thing is the size of a very large refrigerator. Um, uh, and what it is, is it's a model of an economic system, of the British economy. So at the top of the bottom are large tanks full of water, and all the way through it are running all these pump pipes and taps uh, and little kind of uh, gauges, and all of these can be twisted and turned. And the boxes that you see are marked things like um, income tax, or, or, uh, or sales tax, or uh, the savings rate, or interest rates. And by adjusting those little taps, water can be made to flow into different buckets, into things like the treasury, or national insurance, or national savings. It's a, it's a calculator, or a simulator for the economy. And it was designed as a teaching tool um, uh, at the London School of Economics, where Phillips worked. Um, Though actually he, it was discovered to be so accurate that he then built copies of it for government departments so that they could actually use it to, uh, to make economic plans for the actual country. And as, again, what I love about it is that it, because of its use of water, because of this physical analog continuity of its material, its non-binariness, it seems to be closer to the world than a machine built to peel out of ones and zeros that kind of abstracts these problems into a mathematical realm. We know that finance is, is chaotic and turbulent. We know it because we use words like liquidity uh, to describe it. Uh, it has these watery qualities. Um, and by placing these physically into the machine in the form of the material, the machine retains something of that liveliness. Right? This is not abstract ones and zeros. This is real stuff falling through the, the tubes in front of you. And I think that makes a difference about the kind of computation that you do with it and the way in which you understand the things you work with. You're closer to the ground, closer to the earth, closer to the conditions that are impacted by the use of this technology. So these are the kind of ideas that I'm interesting with regard to technology, ecology, the environment, and the, the relationships between them, but really more than just computers, how we think about them. And so briefly before I shut up and we do some questions, um, I'll share one, one of the ways I'm thinking about this, in particular, the way that I'm thinking about how to make work that does work in the way that I talked about at the beginning. Um, so we've seen that I mean, the example I gave of the uh, slime molds who are capable of performing certain types of computation better than any of the other computers that we have, right? There's many, many examples of this that I could go into in a different talk. 
But the basic idea behind what I'm about to speak about is the idea that we could replace every part of contemporary computation with something else, um, something closer to the earth in the way that I've been talking about, by which I mean closer to the world, more like an oracle machine than an automatic machine, something biological, something ecological, something microbiological, who knows, um, that would do all the work of computation, but perhaps do it differently. So here, here's, here's a, a way of thinking about this. This diagram shows the von Neumann architecture, which is the other leg to the Turing's machine. Turing described the logic of the computer, and von Neumann in the 1940s, John von Neumann described its architecture, uh, which is also inside the computer that you're using now and inside pretty much every computer in the world. Uh, you have input and output, and in between that you have a processor and memory. It's a pretty simple architecture. It's what all computers do. And so the way I've started thinking about what I'm calling server farm is, a, um, is, is what parts of the world could be used to replace those things. We have biological systems, the slime molds, which we know do forms of information processing. We know there's kinds of plants that are reactive to certain stimuli and are also expressive of them. So in this example, we have the mimosa on the left, which is a plant, one of the few plants that reacts in human time to human stimuli. Uh, if you touch it, it curls up kind of instantly. It has this amazing effect. It makes it very popular for experiments. Maybe that could be an input device. In the middle, you have the slime molds doing the computation that has some kind of memory storage. Who knows what that might be? Um, there's already all kinds of experiments of how to encode information into DNA, for example. So would we go on to do full on kind of gene rigging or, or would we favor perhaps a slower process of kind of crossbreeding between different species decided of course by the slime molds and not by us to produce different outcomes that could be expressed in, in fields of flowers or the, the fruiting of different crops. This is sketching out at the very beginning of what a, a wholly biological computational system might look like. The point of which is not just to replicate the computers we already have, but to build entirely new computers for different kinds of questions. Because, and I want to stress this, the server farm will be real at some point. I'm planning on starting an actual farm, though it may take several decades to achieve. Um, but I'm going to build an actual farm. And as well as figuring out how it operates, how I ask it questions and how the farm answers them, a lot of the thinking will also have to be, what sort of questions are useful to ask and also what sort of questions are interesting to the organisms that make up the farm so they're interested in talking to me it's a larger question around communicating with the modern human world paying attention to it and drawing ourselves to it uh, we can talk a bit more about so far later um so yeah i just i wanted to stress that or oh, oh, well to say a bit more about so far actually it, and art in general. It's inspired by a few things. It's inspired by the work of Agnes Deans, who in 1982 planted two acres of wheat in Lower Manhattan on the, um, uh, the rubbish piles from the World Trade Center and grew an entire harvest of wheat in the middle of the city, uh, an act of kind of quite extraordinary regeneration as a public art, an extraordinary statement of what it is that art actually could be doing in the world. Um, more than just posing clever questions and failing to answer them, but actually participating in kind of regenerative principles. It's inspired by work like Hans Hacker's rainwater purification plant, work that does the work. Instead of talking about the problems of climate change and the environment, again, working to actively remediate them um, as part of a kind of, um, also an exposition, while also drawing attention to them, showing ways in which they can be changed. And it's also, you know, something that doesn't look like a gallery or an institution, looks a bit more like a farm, perhaps, uh, a permaculture computer in the way the Bec a famous permaculture farm in Northern France that is a huge inspiration to me in my work as well. Um, this is kind of what I think these things should look like, but that's as far as I've got so far. Um, so I think I'll stop there and go to questions. And I hope that was interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, James, uh, for a really interesting lecture. So um, 
now we are jumping to uh, a Q&A session. So again, for our uh, online viewers, um, you can ask your questions uh, in the YouTube or uh, contacted chats. Uh, and these questions will be forwarded to us. So we uh, will be like answering them and uh, interpreting them into our discussion. So um, while you are thinking, <laughs> I mean, our online viewers, while you are thinking about uh, your questions that you want to ask, uh, I think I got um, a lot of uh, questions from, from my side. Uh, and uh, the first block of questions uh, targeting uh, server farm project. Uh, because I think it's a kind of a, like a project that summarizes uh, the talk, and uh, also it's 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 a lot of uh, moving parts uh, as I think would be interesting um, to discuss. So um, first, I, I, I think uh, the, the like a uh, the base ground uh, question uh, for myself uh, would be. Um, how James, uh, you like a different shade between uh, using sustainable energy sources for computation, like uh, in Julio in Oliver project Harvest, and your server farm project. Uh, what is the difference? Like, um, I'm wondering. Um, I really like Julian's work, uh, and I really like that project. Um, but yeah, they're 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 quite they're very different things. I think with very different aims. Um, using um, uh, I mean, harvest is also, it's not just about doing computation, it's specifically, I think, about mining cryptocurrency. So mm -hmm. it's also particularly thinking about how to use a bad technology, uh, <laughs> which is cryptocurrencies, to do some kind of good without doing the environmental damage that they cause, which they cause massively. Um, so, I, I mean, I think Julian's addressing that quite specifically there, if he would mind me speaking about it in that way. Um, but the broader thing of like, what's the difference? The, the difference essentially is that I'm not trying to do the same kind of computation, but less damagingly. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to do a new kind of computation that actively makes things better, um, that actually changes the situation rather than trying to um make what we're already doing slightly less bad um which I, which which is really the you know and i think that that dramatizes a much larger question about ecological technology and particularly about renewable energies that if our intention of like shifting over to renewable energies is only to be able to continue our current um ways of living uh we're fucked, basically. <laughs> Pardon my French. Um, like it's that A, it won't work. Uh, B, it will continue to damage the planet in other ways. And C, it will also continue the the kind of vast inequalities that our current energy regimes generate. Um, there's between different types of people, and simply swapping out one battery source for another isn't going to change any of that. Um, so alongside, you know, a change in the way we produce energy has also got to be a, a change in the way that we, we use it and think about what it's for. Um, now in counterpoint to that, I would also say, one thing I'm super fascinated but haven't really thought enough about is the way in which renewable forms of energy might produce new politics kind of directly. Mm -hmm. For example, and I don't know if this is the case in Russia, but in Greece, I, I know quite a lot of people are increasingly involved in energy cooperatives, where a bunch of people get together and fund their own, in this case, solar farms. So a bunch of people bound together to invest themselves in, in this kind of energy transformation. And that's good because it means there's more solar renewable going into the grid, but it also creates these kind of new communities around this kind of stuff. And I think that's super fascinating. I was talking to a friend recently who works for a big renewable energy company in the UK. And he made the point that right, as we transition to these new energy systems, the entire energy grid has to be reconfigured, um, particularly because energy needs to be stored. You need to basically put big batteries on every street. This is one of the things you need to do. And one of the things he said was like, we are literally redistributing power, you know? Mm -hmm. And he meant, he meant political power as well as like, you know, electrical power. 
And so I think there's something there's something interesting in that that's gonna that's gonna be worth thinking about in the future is the way in which these these energy systems perhaps produce new kind of communities, new polities, new politics. Yes, it's uh, super fascinating how you are linking uh, the energy resource with the politics. Uh, I, I think we can like uh, start even <laughs> a separate discussion, uh, discussion yeah. out of it completely. <laughs> but, but so, I, but I, I, just yeah. so because I just had a thought, I hadn't had the thought, um, and because that's what we've been saying the internet will do forever, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, we like some of us have believed, might still believe somehow that by creating different configurations of networks, we change the nature of power. And, and the idea that, we, and I think it's becoming apparent that the energy grid could be one of those networks as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but at the, at the same time, uh, for, for myself at least, like um, how, how I see right now uh, the web free trend, it's like still uh, the, the idea of the distributed network it's returning but uh, the problems with the like a centralization and the capital are still the same like yeah but the web, web 3 is not is not distributed or decentralized yes yes, yes. So, yeah, yeah it's 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 all still the capital uh and uh, so uh returning to the, the computation topic uh mm -hmm. <laughs> before we flew away <laughs> <laughs> to politics and energy uh so you, you told it's all uh, politics and energy yeah. <laughs> so um you told that a uh, server farm it's uh computes differently right so it's a different uh kind of computation if you compare it with a harvest project which basically computes a, a blockchain so i'm wondering mm -hmm. uh is there a something that server farm compute i mean uh, any kind of calculation or any kind I don't of know yet. image <laughs> I don't know yet. Um, I don't know. My the idea is based on the, so the idea com, comes actually not just from these ideas of, of computation. And, and other ways of doing need multiple forms of intelligence involved. And I take this lesson from various places. Um, uh, I take it from the fact that, is that everything is intelligent. Um, that intelligence exists in multiple forms, in multiple beings, in pretty much everything. In fact, I would say in everything that exists on this planet, living and some not so obviously living, that we can actually ascribe intelligence and see it in action in all these different kinds of ways. So intelligence is multiple, mm -hmm. right? And exists in multiple forms. And, and, and the other thing that I'm super interested in is, is political forms that um uh that draw on the idea that having multiple viewpoints in multiple forms of intelligence is critical to problem solving a really good example as as kind of opposite um alternatives to or as supports for the kind of central government uh, a good example is the, the citizens' assemblies that ran in Ireland in the last few years. Uh, so in 2012, I think, Ireland formed this thing called the Citizens' Assembly. Mm -hmm. And they wanted, they had five questions that the government couldn't answer, basically. Or the government didn't know how to answer these questions. Uh, and these were things like, what should our environmental policy be? Uh, what should we do about the problem of an aging population? Uh, uh, what should we do about abortion or abortion law? And they, they formed this thing called the Citizens' Assembly, uh, where they took 100 people at random from across the country, completely at random. They went through the, you know, the, the census, the electoral roll. They picked 100 people at random, and they put them all in a hotel together for a series of weekends. Uh, and there's a process. They had lectures from experts. There were kind of testimony from interested groups and so on and so forth. But the hundred people who've never met each other before, who came from every age group, uh, every kind of piece of political life, and this is Ireland, so like you have a lot of different views. Um, and at the end, they made recommendations, and they made amazing recommendations. For example, this is the reason I, abortion is now legal in Ireland. Um, this was, you know, abortion was illegal uh, for most of the 20th century, and was so highly contested and such a like hot button topic that politicians wouldn't even talk about it. 
Um, but as a result of the Citizens' Assembly, uh, they called for a referendum and it was legalized. And then they did this again with the environment. Uh, they recommended a whole bunch of things, the declaration of a climate emergency, a whole bunch of new laws, but again, the have been too scared to push for it because they thought that, the, that people wouldn't accept them. But these hundred people who came from a whole bunch of different perspectives, worked through them, came to agreements. I mean, even coming to an agreement amongst the hundred people in this day and age, right? When we're all freaked out by the internet and arguing online all the time and in public, <laughs> They reached consensus of a hundred random people. So, and not only did they reach consensus, they reached kind of radical consensuses. They came up with new ideas that hadn't even been seen or heard before. And one of the explanations for that, quite possibly, is particularly this combination of many different viewpoints, in this case, all human intelligences, but many different intelligences, many different ways of thinking. You didn't have a hundred scientists, you didn't have a hundred politicians, you don't have a hundred engineers who all essentially think in very similar ways to one another. You had a hundred people who think in very different ways, who come from totally different life experiences and totally different backgrounds. And this seems to be one way of coming up with really interesting answers to things that no one had imagined before. Now pair that with what I said earlier about the intelligence of non-human beings. And you say, well, if we've got some really big, terrifying questions to answer that we're not even sure how to pose, that are about the entirety of the Earth, then it's also not just humans we need to be asking. We need to be asking everyone else who lives on this planet. Animals, plants, ecosystems. Systems, everything. Right? Humans are involved too, and so are these plants and whatever. And I'm just using the computation, the computer as a kind of metaphor for how you connect things up together with inputs and outputs, but that's not really the important bit. The important bit is how do we talk seriously and meaningfully with with everyone else on the planet. So probably it would be like a how uh, we will ask these questions uh, from a server farm. So uh, I, I mean, uh, sometimes uh, as we've seen uh, in a flower token or Terra Zero projects, um we are using uh external uh computing resources like uh, uh satellites or any kind of remote sensing or hardware sensors to communicate with the nature so in in this case uh is server farm project completely isolated from uh, classical computing or how it might be no no i mean it wouldn't it wouldn't really satisfy my own criteria that i've just described if machines and people weren't involved at all, right? Because mm -hmm. like we're part of the thing as well. Um, but I can also imagine it happening right inside the there, serverfarm.jamesbridal.com, plug the URL. Uh, there's actually a short story that I wrote, weirdly. That's kind of like a science fiction short story about the server farm. Um, in which someone is trying to figure out how it works, just as we're doing now. And in that, it seems to be that a bunch of like herbs have been grown, for example, right? Herbs contain a bunch of like particular essential oils or various kinds of substances that are then fed to slime molds that cause the slime molds to react in different ways, to assume different patterns. And then those patterns are used, planting of other plants to, to design the layout of a garden that flowers in particular ways, uh, that then creates a kind of messaging system, mm -hmm. right? So you can, using the computational metaphor of inputs, processing, outputs, perhaps memory stores as well, you can design a system in which different, different things talk to one another, like verbally or otherwise. Um, I don't yet know how that's going to work. Actually, inputs and outputs and questions and answers. Um, but it, does it have to involve machines? Who knows at this point? It definitely has to involve us and our thinking about it. And it has to be legible to us in some ways. But apart from that, who knows? Mm -hmm. I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so uh, because, because well, well, you are talking about this like uh, five patterns of flowers, uh, etc. So how we arrange uh, the information as a farm. Uh, I always like uh, remembering how in our lab, uh, in the intensive landscape lab in Innsbruck, we are talking with colleagues that uh, landscape uh, basically. Uh, it can be represented as an information. Basically, it's a huge informational resource and uh, it has different like mm -hmm. informational layers inside of it. And through the satellite imagery, we can extract these layers. And uh, in one of your talks, I think that you gave uh, in Greece, um, in TED, you are talking that uh, computation at, at some point, especially in, in the environmental computation, let's name it like this, it's it's always kind of binded, uh, as I understood the talk, uh, with a resource extraction, right? So basically, we, we are uh, pouring money through oil and gas companies to uh, analyze the errors. And, uh, and I'm always thinking, like, uh, from, from your point of view, is it ethical uh, to use, like, a satellite? images to talk about ecology i mean it's not ethical to do anything really at present i mean i know it's a flippant thing to say you know we live inside that system um I, I, yeah, I point to say that, 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 that i would like to conceptualize the server farm as something that didn't rely on systems like that that really was trying to make a break with them in meaningful ways. At the same time, I love those systems, to be very clear. And a lot of my work and thinking at the moment is like, how do we create a more kind of ethical and ecologically just? Because I have no desire to do that either. And I, there's a whole chapter in my forthcoming book like trying to save satellites basically <laughs> but um because you know my, my feeling about them is it matters who makes them who uses them what they're for you know and um, there's 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 a, there's a difference between earth observation satellites like landsat uh, or you know these other kind of ones and military satellites which are most of them you know um, mm -hmm. or, or satellites that are used for oil exploration. Or, like it, it matters what we use technology for. Um, and we have a conscious choice about this, you know? And that, that's, for me, the thing that really matters. There's a, my favorite story about this, which I, which I tell in the book, is, is the story of um, what happened a few years ago when uh, the director of, of um, like, uh, of, of outer space uh, imaging, uh, at, so the guy who runs Hubble, basically, the guy who runs the Hubble's telescope and now the James Webb Space Telescope, he got a call one day from uh, someone from the National Geospatial Agency. And the National Geospatial Agency is the third big spy agency in the US after CIA, NSA, National Geospatial Agency. It also has the biggest budget because it builds all the spy satellites. And this guy calls up the guy at NASA, like, you know, secret military factory somewhere near New York. And inside a massive warehouse are two huge, complete space telescopes. <laughs> um, they've had quite a few bits removed, but both of these things are better than the Hubble telescope, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which, which until the James Webb launched in December was like a 30 years old cutting edge bit of space telescope two entirely brand new ones. And these things were basically obviously surplus. The, 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 you know, the, the military spy complex has so much more money than like civilian space, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, but they gave these two satellites um, and they quickly realized that um, uh, these, these were really good space telescopes. And one of them, they're currently arguing over what to do with one, but one of them is being turned into a thing called the W first, the World Wide Field Infrared Spectrometry Telescope, um, which will be launched in maybe 2027, which is going to um, like look for evidence of cosmic background radiation, is going to be used to discover exoplanets. Um, but basically, all they've done 
is they've taken this telescope, which was designed, and it was very obviously designed for looking down at Earth and doing surveillance, and they've just turned it around to look at space and do science, right? And it's such a beautiful and brilliant example of how we can choose what to do with our technology. You know, of course they're compromised, and of course they're built on all kinds of labor and exploitation and whatever. We have to use the materials around us, but we can make some pretty serious choices about what we choose to do this way. Um, so whether the server farm involves satellites or not, I don't know, but I, I, I think satellites are awesome. I hope they're not going anywhere. Yeah, but the example with the telescope is amazing. Uh, like, uh, it's uh, again, how we can turn the technology uh, and convert some, something that was initially uh, meant to spy on us or kill us into something that allow us to survive mm -hmm. and to produce new, 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 new things. Uh, and while we are still uh, at the point of uh, satellites, I, I'm, I'm wondering about your like a cloud index project. So I, I wanted to ask this question. I don't know if it relates to like a general topic of the lecture, but uh, as I understood the cl uh, cloud index uh, as a simulation and uh, So while I'm thinking about the simulation, I had a question in mind, like, uh, what do you think is a simulation, uh, maybe not as it's represented in the cloud index, but maybe other abstract simulation, is this is a simulation uh, can be something similar to a living ecosystem, or it's a completely artificial object? I mean, I guess it can be like it, but I think we can... I think it's a bit easy to get to confuse. I, I think there is such a thing as reality, if I'm allowed. I'm to say that. Um, that. That there is multiple worlds that are discrete. and separate worlds, but I think they're overlapping. I think a simulation is an imagination of an ecosystem or a universe, but everything that supports that simulation is still rooted in this universe, in this world. The computer that's running the simulation is part of a real ecosystem. So of course you can simulate an ecosystem, mm -hmm. but it still has an effect in the actual ecosystem, in the in the real world, in reality that underlies that. That doesn't mean it's it means it's not real in a in a way that I think matters. Um, because because what I see happening with a lot of technology at present is a really willful kind of abstraction from the earth. A real kind of address problems with the real world. You know, I, I think quite, you know these ideas around the metaverse, or um, you know, they're they're really they're interesting for themselves, sure, but they are also a very clear turning away from reality. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I'm I have to be careful because I. I I worry about myself talking about <laughs> reality in this really like clear cut way, right? <laughs> and, and because, because it feels incredibly um, solipsistic and, and I don't know, selfish and also just sort of like grand white male, I don't know, like I, I know what reality is and you don't kind of crap, which I don't believe in, but obviously I say quite a lot. Um, but yeah, I, I, the, the, you can simulate an ecosystem, sure, but don't mistake the simulation for reality. And reality is not yours. Maybe this is what I'm trying to express. The re reality doesn't belong to anyone. It's a shared, perhaps hallucination, but shared experience. Reality is, is where we all live. 
reality is the thing that you share with other people. Reality is the thing, who said that? Reality is the thing that doesn't go away when you close your eyes. Um, mm. It's a quote from somewhere. Yes. But like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you can switch off the simulation, you can separate from everything else, but you can't separate everything else from reality. And I think that's really important to bear in mind. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a really interesting um, uh, idea, I think, and uh, also interesting how you are joining uh, like a, the computation of simulation with the environment, uh, like a, through this like a computer which still stays inside of the environment and it emanates heat into the environment, right? So basically, through, even through byproducts of computation, it's linked. So we link the simulation and uh, the reality. So. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure, like, uh, for, if you today skipped this slide, but I really liked uh, in your like initial slides the slide about cloud seeding, uh, when we move uh, some data uh, from one point uh, to another by a physical um, ob objects. So uh, while uh, cloud seeding is completely um, artificial um, object. Um, what I'm wondering is that, like, uh, do you think that, like, uh, when uh, people move information by themselves, like, uh, when they interact on a physical level, on a level of reality, uh, as you're saying, like, uh, with this information, like, with this uh, bones, with the uh, skin, uh, with these hard drives, etc., is this creates something like a um, cybernetic ecosystem? Because I'm really um, uh, always kind of uh, rotate in mind this project by Danny Vasiliev, uh, the colleague of uh, Julian Oliver, called Netless, where he, when he attached uh, the network devices, basically the storage of people, and then mm. when people are moving through the city, uh, basically they start to work like a cybernetic uh, network. So basically, people are carrying information on themselves in these uh, computing devices, but uh, e everything stops if people are like a stop moving. So the information spread is, is like a basically stopped at this point. So I'm wondering, like, uh, is this cloud cloud seeding like this simple example when we move by Amazon truck a huge array of information from one city to another? Is this a kind of a cybernetic ecosystem okay. or not from your point of view? Uh, that's a lot. Um, love Danya and his work. I don't know that work, so I'll have to go and look it up. Um, uh, I'm not sure what you mean, I'll be honest. Um, but my immediate response, you can rephrase the question if you like, but my, my immediate response is that I, I'm not sure why what you're describing as a cybernetic ecosystem is not mm -hmm. just an ecosystem. Um, like, because again, it's just not separate from everything else. Um, uh, if, that's the, if that's the point you're making, I may be wrong. Um, but one thing I understand is that everything is, everything is part of the being and becoming of this shared world. Um, in the sense that, for me, networks and satellites and Amazon trucks are as much part of the, the evolution, the being and the becoming of the planet, of nature, of whatever you want to call it, as trees, rainforests, ducks, you know, anything else. Like, there's, mm -hmm. not, there's not like a, a line between the natural and the artificial in that sense. It's all just kind of blowing up mm -hmm. out of everything. And I, and I, and I think, it's really, I found it very useful myself not to draw those kind of distinctions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the other thing I think about a lot is, um, uh, so really lovely talk recently, broadcast by Axiom in Ljubljana, uh, a conversation with Kim Stanley Robinson, a science fiction writer who I'm a huge fan of. And his, his most recent book, uh, The Ministry for the Future, is really fascinating and really worth reading. In this talk, he said he was asked, or actually maybe I asked him in YouTube comments. See, YouTube comments work, use them people. Um, uh, I, I asked him this right now, like to, to just talk about geoengineering a bit, because it's something he's thought about a lot and it's something that I'm super interested in and I really respect his opinion.
And he said, if the Anthropocene means anything, I'm not sure he said, I'll say, if the Anthropocene means anything, this idea that like humans are now a part of the kind of the geological presence and activeness of the earth, that everything we do is geoengineering, like not just cloud seeding, not just like, you know, you know, these kind of big ideas. And his examples were also surprising. So like, it's not just like you filling up your car with petrol is geoengineering. It's also like education is geoengineering. He made the point that the, the thing that most affects um, uh, like livable climate futures is, is, is the education of women. Uh, historically, like the, the more countries uh, educate non-male members of their populations, uh, the, like that is one of the best you can do for the climate. Uh, so education is geoengineering, brilliant. Um, and that for me kind of feeds back into my first point, it's like everything being an ecology, everything being part of ecosystems. If eco, mm -hmm. eco means the home, I'm in Greece. It, ecos is, is the home, it's the dwelling place. It just means mm -hmm. like where we are and also everything that surrounds us. So like, <laughs> it all matters. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's quite what you're asking, but that's what I think that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but that's exactly uh, was my question. Uh, and um, the, the answer is really uh, interesting. Uh, for myself, I also think uh, that uh, the ecology is just one, and uh, there is no like differentiations between um, like a technology and uh, like a natural ecology. Um, but like a, speaking about like a um, natural ecology, uh, like a, in its like a definitive form, uh, you mentioned in a lecture uh, the slime mold, right, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, how it solves. Uh, the traveling uh, salesman problem. So, uh, and uh, I, I'm wondering, like, uh, is it kind of a computation or it is an intuition? And what is the, like a difference from your point of view? I'm not, I'm not sure there is a functional difference. Um, mm -hmm. I know it's a bit like chewing and the imitation game. It's like, Turing's idea about artificial intelligence when he invented the Turing test, or what he called the imitation game, but he called the Turing test, was that it didn't really matter if something was intelligent. It just mattered if it had the appearance of intelligence. Um, does it behave in an intelligent way? Then it's intelligent. That was Turing's kind of rule of thumb. Because he generally thought that, like, the idea of intelligence as something innate is really a question of consciousness. And we know that's that's not answerable in language uh, or our brains or anything else. Like, we, like the question of consciousness is, is, not, is not answerable. But the question of the appearance of consciousness, the appearance of intelligence, we can, we can, we can answer that. And I think this is, this is a similar kind of deal. Like they're doing computation, like why they're doing it, um, that we can, we can discuss and argue and the answers may be super <laughs> interesting. Um, uh, you know, I'm really interested in bringing this question of like how interested these organisms are, like making them subjects rather than objects of these kind of interactions. Um, like, do they want to participate in this weird experiment? Um, uh, I think I think that's really important to kind of keep coming back to. Um, but uh, I'm sure there's really interesting philosophical answers to these things, but they're not, I, I, I guess, that is not the questions about, this is not, this is not meant to be a slight on your question, by the way. I'm just not interested in that distinction. It just doesn't really have any particular meaning to me. Like this thing is happening. And, 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 and I think that reason is, is, is because of this kind of like parallax view of what we're discussing, mm -hmm. right? By which I mean like, looked at one way we can call it computation Look, looked at the other way we can call it some kind of like instinct or behavior or whatever like but that's just that's just the language and the viewpoint that we have for like bringing it up the thing is happening and by viewing it in a particular way 
we can make it do or think it doing something interesting that's useful or beautiful to us. And trying to nail it down as doing one thing or another just isn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, isn't, uh, that's it, interesting. It isn't particularly helpful for me. Like, I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, it doesn't. So, so yeah. basically, you kind of the slide mode. I'm not interested in the question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so basically, you are like joining uh, the intelligence, cognition, and computation together. So, I mean, uh, just the, like a uh, thing uh, on the tip of my mind is that, like, uh, still, like uh, when we mentioned a Turing machine, right? Uh, you you had it on your one of your slides. It's a completely kind of a binary thing, right? So you can mm. go up, you can go down. That's it by again if you're referencing the water machine and the, you, you 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 told us that it's a little bit different thing so it's uh, not just uh, zeros and ones it's a kind of flow that computes so uh i am wondering like uh, how do you think uh, if, if, from artistic perspective what, what is like a, a feelable difference between this like other type of computation like uh, mm. what is the difference I started doing some of this stuff because, uh, well, so we talked about the cloud index earlier, right? Mm -hmm. um, which was kind of my first project where I tried to use neural networks or whatever. But um, I didn't really enjoy that project um, because I didn't really know what I was doing. And uh, I had to hire someone to do all the computing bits, which I don't like doing. I'm I'm really bad at computers, actually, but like I, I can usually get them to do something interesting along what I want them to do. And at this time, I couldn't. So I worked with someone really brilliant, Gene Kogan, an artist in his own right. Who makes yeah, really I know him. Fantastic work. And he did a fantastic job. But it was deeply dissatisfying from my perspective because I didn't do it. And therefore, I didn't really learn about it. I didn't, I didn't really understand the material that I was working with. Um, you know, because, because for me, all of these works are like experiments out of which I learn something. And, and usually the work is interesting when I, when it shows not what I did, but what I learned. Um, and as a result of that, I then ended up doing a different, doing another like neural network based project, which is why I tried to build my own self-driving car. Um, or at least like to train my own self-driving car. I like teach a neural network to drive a car, which was like weirdly quite successful. Um, as in like, I, you know, I did develop a neural network that could drive. I, I wouldn't get in a car with it, but it did basically work. And the difference was that I, because I was working with the system directly and programming it myself, I really got a feel for it. And like understood it as something that I, I had a relationship with personally, um, and and it was a, a precisely that point. I'm sorry, I can't remember what your question was or if this is what it was about. This is what I'm going to talk about. Um, it was a precisely that point of working with myself that um, something changed in the nature of my relationship to that work, but also to AI in general. When it you know it became it became the subject rather than an object. Um, it became something with its own being, its own biases, desires, needs. Um, what's the word that Keller Easterlin always uses? Disposition. Something mm -hmm. of its own disposition. Something that made it stand out for itself as a thing in the world, rather than just being the kind of subject of a bunch of typing into a computer. And that was a really, really fascinating moment for me that only came about because I like worked with the thing itself. Um, I'd say I've had the same experience growing vegetables, frankly. Um, like, <laughs> once you put yourself into a position of like having a direct one-to-one -one relationship with other beings, uh, they surprise you in, in, <laughs> in occasionally interesting and often disappointing ways, if you're a vegetable gardener like me. Um, yeah, I don't know where this is going. Um, was there a question about the materiality? 
<laughs> no, but he exactly answered it like uh, uh, again from uh, as I understood from your point of view, like uh, when we are interacting with this other type of computation, it gives us like a, a, a new experience. Yes. Yeah, yes. so that's exactly uh, yeah, yeah. the answer. Very, very, specifically. very yes. specific. And so, so yeah, so that's that's what I'm really, that's not what I'm hoping for. That's what I will get from server farm if it gets built. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. a new form of computation, it will also be like a new experience and a new encounter with another who I haven't met yet, but I'm really hoping to meet. Mm -hmm. So uh, we got one question from the audience, uh, and that's <laughs> about the picture uh, on your back. Uh, so can you tell us uh, about it? Like it's a kind of a landscape, as I see, right? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's very appropriate um, because it is. Uh, it's the image used on the cover of my new book. Uh, oh, cool. uh, but of course, I went above and beyond slightly. Uh, the the designers of my new book, which is called Ways of Being, and it's out in April in English. Um, they, uh, sorry, my colleagues just leaving. Um, uh, they uh, they've made a lovely cover that features a incredibly bright, beautifully coloured satellite image. And so, of course, I went and found the original satellite image, which is hanging behind me, which is a um, multi-spectral image taken by a Landsat satellite of mountains in a particular area of South America uh, in about 10 years ago. I think, I think the image is about 10 years old, maybe not even that old. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a landscape, but very specifically, it's a, yeah, it's a multi-spectral image, uh, which is one of the reasons that I love satellites. So satellites don't, satellites don't just have cameras on them, and they don't just see the world like we see them. They have these devices on them called multispectral images that are actually capable of sensing across multiple spectrums. So from the deep ultraviolet all the way into the infrared, they see in frequencies that our eyes aren't capable of seeing. And then you can put those different layers together as different data in order to see certain things. So if you use bits in the past, for example, or if you use bits of the ultraviolet, you can see how healthy the plants are. And that's that's what you're seeing in those kind of amazing vision of the world that is showing us things about the biological world that we can't see. Mm -hmm. That's kind of interceding on our behalf to make the world more understandable to us. And also at the same time, more beautiful. Which is, which is pretty much one of the, you know, not many artists manage that, is what I'll say. I think Landsat is one of the better artists around in that sense, in the sense that it makes the world meaningful and beautiful at the same time. And I think that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's uh, also what fascinates me in satellites, like uh, you're not getting the Earth, on your picture you are getting like a, a data and information it's also a, a, an interesting way how we observe a, a planet uh through the information like a, through the different layers of information um but, 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 but so you are getting the planet like yes it, yes, it is yes the planet yeah it's just that... <laughs> not the human way of seeing the planet yes yes right like our way of seeing the planet is only one of infinite ways of viewing the planet this is mm -hmm. still the planet. This is just the planet, how the planet is seen by this particular type of machine, you know? Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's kind of magic and special. Yeah, but uh, I mean, uh, in, in this case, maybe uh, from my point of view, like uh, maybe you not agree, like uh, maybe that's a metaverse, like uh, because the metaverse itself, like it's a plural form of a universe, right? So if you think about like a satellite images, it's a projection. Uh, of a reality of one of the, like informational projections, maybe that's like a, how this like a, a new uh, virtuality created like a, through, through these different layers through these different computations. I think there's a difference between something wholly virtual and something that's a uh, um, another way of seeing. Mm -hmm. Like the my understanding, the metaverse is 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 a 
is not grounded in the reality that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. This is this is the reality, but because it's a reality that we share. Like we can go and walk on those mountains. Mm -hmm. We can go and find the tree that's like a slightly darker green than all the other ones there because it's dying and running out of water. Like we share this world. This is not a picture of a metaverse. Mm -hmm. This is just a picture of the world as another being sees it. And and like perhaps the most interesting thing about computers is that they make pictures of the world that we share that we can also participate in. This is this is actually like possibly the only or the, the, the central thought is this book that I've got coming out that I keep talking about, which is that the potential, particularly of artificial intelligence. It's not really anything. And this has nothing to do with metaverses or alternative realities or simulations or anything else. And it comes back to this point that it's kind of said over and over again, which is that we, we share a world and there's just lots and lots of different ways of being in it. Um, and, and the machine way of being is there along with the human way of being and the dolphin way of being and the, the oak tree way of being. Um, it just happens that after several millennia, we built we sort of constructed something that's enough like us that we can slightly share in its way of being. Maybe that's what the simulation is, you know? But the, the real purpose of that shared way of being is to remind us that we actually share it with everything else as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, really... Mm -hmm. uh joints in this case like how, how it's, it creates us a different um, view so uh, I, I think we can uh, we have a, a one a question uh, time for one question left okay I think we're out of time, out of time. Yeah, okay uh, in this case we can uh, wrap or because uh, I, I, in the chat I received that it depends on us so if you don't mind um, on, one more then yeah yeah, You're yeah. Awesome. so um I, I'm wondering that uh, in um, uh, in you dark age, uh, you're mentioning that uh, there is like a, a cognitive impact of a global warming. Mm -hmm. So like uh, as the temperature rises, uh, our like a cog uh, cognition capabilities um, lowering. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, uh, is it affects um, a biocomputation in in, in 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 if you refer, refer to a server farm project, for example? Like a, and how, how it affects it? Uh, in differently, but absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, like the the, the that, that story, which those don't know, is the fact that like uh, carbon dioxide affects brain function. Um, he says stuttering when with all the windows closed. Um, uh, as CO2 rises, like brain function, cognitive function decreases. Um, the, the, the figure I quote and you quoted is at a thousand parts per million. Um, human cognitive function drops by 20%, which is a lot. Uh, and to be honest, that's quite normal inside like classrooms and offices and everything else. So open the windows. Um, uh, but really, I only make that point to say that it's not just plants <laughs> that are affected by raising carbon dioxide. Of course they are. Uh, if we keep doing all this damage to the planet, there ain't gonna be any us and there ain't gonna be any server farm either. Um, there may be something else weird, like the slime molds might be okay. <laughs> There's quite a lot of animals and plants that are actually doing kind of okay. I heard spiders, spiders love climate change. Uh, there's loads more spiders than there were, which is brilliant. Um, uh but yeah i think i think I, what that question dramatizes is the fact that this really is a shared future um but not just biocomputing and not just human brains but human life and all other life on the planet is seriously threatened by the way we're living and behaving right now uh you know rapidly warming climate plus you know extreme weather events plus contemporary politics 
equals no us, no server farm, certainly no biocomputing. Um, what, except biocomputing has already happened, or so I should point out. Like, in the sense that I'm only, I'm the one who's calling it biocomputing. Uh, you know, the plants just call it getting on with like living and growing and good for them. So yeah, bio, biocomputing is part of my own projection simulation. Uh, yeah, everything else will probably be okay. Yes, that's uh, a great uh, last answer. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for uh, a thoughtful uh, discussion and uh, for the really interesting uh, lecture. So uh, we are wrapping up. Uh, thank you, everyone who was uh, with us online. Thank you, James, for being with us today. Uh, thank you, thank you, Olga, for uh, inviting me and organizing this talk. Thank you very much. Uh, bye. Thank you very much, and especially huge thanks to Adrian uh, for all the questions. It's been a real pleasure. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. bye.